Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones to silent as they may disturb with the broadcasting. No apologies have been received for today's meeting, but we do welcome for first time at committee Michelle Ballantyne, uh, who's replacing Adam Tompkins, and I'd invite Ms Ballantyne to declare any relevant interests. Yes, the, the only thing I probably should declare at this point, I've just been made patron of a food bank. Um, it will be appearing on my register of interest shortly. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item two today is a decision to take items in private. So we're asked to take item five, which is a consideration of today's and previous evidence and the work programme paper um, going forward. Can we agree to do that in private? Yes. Thank you. And it also seek the committee's agreement that our next meeting, which is a briefing from the Commissioner of Ethical Standards and Public Life for the process of appointing the Chair and members of the Inequality and Poverty Commission, be held entirely in private next week. Thank you very much. Our next item is agenda number three, which is a continuing our evidence sessions on the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, and we would like to uh, welcome to committee this morning Rosemary Agnew, Public S Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, Nicky McLean, Director, John Stevenson, Head of Improvement Standards and Engagement, and Alison Jack, Scottish Welfare Fund Review Team Manager, all of whom are from the Office of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. A very warm welcome to committee and thank you for your briefing for uh, ahead of today's um, appearance at committee. Um, if I could just open with um, a question that I asked of the other organisations last week is, um, has the work you've been doing and the review of casework indicated mm -hmm. any particular pressures that you see coming forward on the Scottish Welfare Fund? Um, I'm not sure I'd say pressures as such. Um, for us, it's relatively early in terms of identifying trends. Um, what we do see, though, are things like um, inconsistencies and there's clearly pressure on the amount of money there is available as well which um, as we know from other briefing can influence um, decision making and what gets paid to where. Um, probably the better person to answer that in more detail is, is Alison because her team are the front line and they do the day-to-day -day work and contact so I'll invite Alison. In terms of pressures, we have definitely started to see some of the impact of welfare reform. Um, we have had a number of councils come on board with um, UC full service rollout. It's been difficult to track particular patterns because there hasn't been perhaps full year's results to compare with the previous year. We do get about 40% of our casework um, from applicants in Glasgow, so we are anticipating that when, we, when they come on board in September later this year, we will see a bigger impact because more people uh, will be affected. Um, so I think welfare reform certainly is, is a pressure that we're seeing in our, our casework day to day for applicants. Does anyone else want to come in on that one? No, I'm going to open questions up to the committee and I'll, I'll bring in Ms McNeil. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, a number of witnesses have raised um, issues um, about the Scottish Welfare Fund and um, w one of the questions I wanted to ask you is um, whether you think that, first of all, in your experience, the way that um, applicants have been treated, have they been treated with dignity and respect or have you found any cases where you felt that that, that wasn't the case? We have... We have... Oh, yeah. we, we have um in some of our findings, we have indicated that perhaps some of the language used may, may be uh, judgmental, and we have fed that back in our criticism to the council. In terms of um, our concerns, I think one of our main concerns has been around access to the, the, the scheme and around the review process. Um, we were quite keen that we wanted to make the independent review process as accessible as possible, so we accept reviews by telephone, but the first tier review um, process, which um, has to, is the stage before ourselves that applicants have to, to apply to the council for, still has to be in writing. Um, we have um, raised this with Scottish Government because we do see that as, as a barrier for some people. 
under exceptional circumstances, they can, the guidance does say that they can make an exception to that. However, we have recorded examples of this being a barrier, both for reasons of disability and um, more commonly for financial reasons. So perhaps they wouldn't necessarily have bus fares to be able to travel to submit their first year review or credit on their phone or um, data, you know, to be able to submit it in, in writing. So that has been a concern in terms of fairness and, and access to the scheme. We also highlighted in our annual review of the guidance um, that Council's duty to make reasonable adjustments, um, we wanted that reinforced because, again, there has been a couple of examples in our casework um, where, where we've assessed that and hasn't necessarily been done. The one thing I would add is um, to take this in perspective because the number of cases we see is not a huge number compared to the number of applications received. But I think the message is, if we are seeing them, then they must be there. Um, and we can't quantify what that might be in its entirety. Because um, I, I would just add to what Alison said about in writing. In writing can also mean email. And there is an assumption that because a service is able to be accessed digitally, that it's easy to access. And that's not always the case. If you bring it down to actual real people, if you don't have anywhere to live, how are you going to get paper and pen? If you don't have anywhere to live, you may not be able to get a contract. So what we're really bringing this down to is the very basic level of vulnerable people getting access. And if they can't get access at first tier, it doesn't matter how accessible we are. Thank you very much. So based on that, would you see that perhaps th th there are some improvements needed to the overall scheme to make sure that that's taken into account of, given the vulnerability of those who apply for these grants in the first place? I think it's a combination of improvements, maybe adjustments to the scheme about making it clearer about access. Uh, I think there's also a very big issue about communication. And this is where we are having... Um, input as well because we don't just make review decisions we also comment on practice and Alison's team um, you know point these out um, we also held an event for practitioners and third party and what we we see is if we can continue that improvement approach and that learning approach what we are able to do over time is raise everybody to the best, because we do see examples of good practice too. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. I, I was going to just add that I think that there are some really simple things that um, we can make sure are happening. So, um, for example, councils are meant to provide a free phone telephone number, and actually, if you look on uh, websites, it's actually really hard to find those numbers. I think it was... Uh, we did a quick review and there are only a couple of councils where it was really obvious. So there are some really basic, simple things that could happen very quickly to make the scheme more accessible. Is all of that information publicly available? Um, I think the reference regarding uh, the free phone numbers isn't something that's publicly available at the moment, but um, it's, it's obviously on authorities' websites for everyone to see. Yeah. But not on your... Presumably, how would we access it from your office? So we have a free phone telephone number, and as um, Alison's highlighted, a, a high number of people that come to our service, it's through a telephone system, but that's not replicated in, within councils. Okay. Um, do you think that, that, that a broader range of options um, for grants uh, that are provided to, to vulnerable people should be looked at? specific things that you had in mind? Um, well, there's only kind of the two forms of assistance, really, that's available. I just wondered if, in the, the case work that you'd looked at, whether you thought there was a there was scope or the necessity for local authorities to look any wider than the provisions they... I, they I think currently... some of it, and I'll invite Alison as well to add to this, is the scope within what's already offered... Um, because there is a, a risk if you make too many options, it becomes confusing 
when you're trying to apply for things, but if within the options you have, you have as broad a scope as you can, um, that, that might also be helpful. I, I don't know if you want to add anything from direct contact. I think I would echo what, what Rosemary has said there. The one thing I would possibly add is that I think we, we have um, made efforts to ensure that the existing criteria is interpreted correctly. Um, an example I would give around that is there's a qualifying criteria which relates to exceptional pressure and that was being quite narrowly interpreted as only applying to families and that was not our interpretation of the legislation and in fact we felt there were very vulnerable single people that were missing out on that on that one criteria. Um, so we upheld a, a number of cases on that basis and, uh, and through discussions with Scottish Government there was clarity that yes that that um, criteria is open to individuals as well as families. Um, so I think it's more around ensuring that the interpretation of the existing criteria is correct. Of whole response, and I just wondered if you, just to conclude on, on my line of questioning, do you think any more work needs done to make sure that local authorities uh, take that into account when they're running their schemes in future? Or Yes, and, and we, we are very much um, happy, looking to be a part of all the, the sort of learning and improvement work that, that's, that's in plan in terms of that. Um, we do a lot of work with councils. We have a, a sounding board every quarter um, where we'll look at case studies. We'll have decision makers there. Um, there's also a practitioners forum that Scottish Government run, um, which um, is, is at the end of June, actually. Um, and we've been out to visit more than, than half of councils to, to meet with teams. So we are doing a lot of learning improvement work around um, the guidance and around interpretation. Um, and and we, we, it's definitely in our, our, our plan to, to continue doing that. You would be reasonably confident then if local authorities were asked that question, whether or not the support available would apply to individuals, you'd be reasonably confident that, that local authorities would now agree that that's the case? Yeah, I think de definitely now that, that message is, has been made clear. Thank you very much. Just add to that, picking up on what we've said already about uh, access to the system and, and making reasonable adjustments and so on, one of the things we do in the, the, the improvement and, and engagement uh, role is to develop tools and resources to help bodies deliver, whether it be complaints handling or, in this case, uh, welfare fund uh, handling. And we're looking in our business plan this year, we've set out a, a, an objective to develop a, a quality assurance tool for uh, welfare fund decision makers that will look at the process from accessibility to receipt of the application to properly identifying what the need is to properly assessing and making a decision on, uh, on the need uh, right through to, to good governance uh, around the, the decision making process and uh, our experience with complaints is that this, this can deliver a, a degree of consistency across the sector so that's one of the issues that we would hope to do during this year to support uh, decision makers and councils. Yes, uh, Ms Ballantyne. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um, obviously, under the, the new Social Security Bill that was passed um, a week or two ago, one of the elements of it was uh, equality of access. And, and there was an implication in, in last week's committee that once that comes through and becomes statute, that falling foul of that will put a lot of councils in difficulty because there was a, a suggestion that a lot of councils weren't currently providing equality of access. I just wondered how big you think that gap is. You know, is it a hop, skip and jump away from, from being able to deliver on equality of access? Or are we actually, have we got a big gap? I'm, I'm not sure there's anything much more we can add over and above what we said about telephone access um, and actually knowing that you are able to. Uh, I don't know if you want to just add to that, but I, I think pretty much our view is that there is work to do on access, whether it's making free phone numbers available, and, and the Social Security Bill might actually be the catalyst for local authorities um, and other agencies making it clear there is a single free phone access point um, for any benefit, not just for, for welfare funder. Uh, don't you want to add something to that? I think one of the differences in, in the way that we're operating the Tier 2 to the previous system when local authorities were undertaking Tier 2 is that um, in every single case we, we will automatically phone up the applicant and talk through the, the evidence that they've provided with them and ask them very, explain the process very clearly and ask them if they have any other further evidence. And I think 
Um, in terms of access, that actual telephone contact communication is absolutely key in ensuring that you fully understand the applicant's circumstances and that you've taken all of the facts and the evidence into consideration. So um, while I know we're really focusing in on this telephone contact, but I think it is absolutely key that you're not relying on people to provide things in writing because it, will, it does really restrict what people's ability to present their case. Um, so I think that we found that to be very effective in dealing with Tier 2 applications. And, and whilst, yes, I, I would accept that, what about if you're deaf and you can't talk to you by telephone? Uh, you know, equality of access and that wider access will mean facilitating everybody regardless yeah. of their circumstance. I, I think perhaps it might slightly different take. Is It's about two things. One is getting into the, the process. So that's the accessibility. And... Um, the, the free phone number works for many. We'd also expect um, public bodies, any public body actually, to make it clear that there's signposting for support or advocacy services. You'd expect telephones um, where possible to come with loop systems. Um, if you're a BSL user, there are services um, that you can access for, for that too. And whilst that's one aspect of accessibility, I think what Nikki's picking up on is accessibility is also about going through the process. And whether the conversation is by phone or whether somebody comes in to speak, it's about making the whole thing accessible, not just the start point, because how the money is paid at the end point is also about accessibility. Um, I can't speak for local authorities about how prepared they are. I would say from what we see, some will be a hop, skip and a jump away, and for some it will be a, a big challenge. And, and I think one of the bigger challenges is going to come down to resources. You know, we are not over-resourced in the Welfare Fund review team. Um, in fact, we are right at the limit of delivering our service, but that doesn't stop us. Um, making the phone calls, talking and engaging with people. But that, I think, would be a very, very big challenge um, if it's something that you've not done before. And it does take, on the face of it, takes more resource. And perhaps that's what we should say. It might take more resource at the delivery point. But if you deliver a better service, it's likely to take less resource by having fewer reviews, by if you do have reviews, they're easier to look at because you have more information available. So it hasn't directly said, I think it's a hop, skip and a jump away, but I think you'll find it's different authorities will need different amounts of work to get there. Thank you. And I think it's safe to say that one of the concerns of the committee is about the, the disparity of service across the 32 local authorities. Um, um, which, which is a theme I'm sure that will come through today in our questioning. But from just what you've said, you've given us the national figures for the, the decisions that have been overturned by, by the, um, your department. Is it, from what you said about the telephone conversations, is there a, any trend that, that it's been poor decision making or just lack of information that has read, led to the wrong decision for people? Which one of you would like to respond? The most common reason, um, both this, this financial year that's just, just ended and in, in the first year of delivering our, delivering our service, was around councils incorrectly interpreting the information that they had available to them. To, to give you a picture of what that might look like in practice, quite commonly we see um, perhaps the evidence not being weighted correctly when considering things like the priority of certain items. So you might have a, a single person not being awarded a washing machine, for example, but actually the council have been advised that the person has a mental health difficulty or a physical health difficulty or a reason that they couldn't go to a laundrette. And, and that has been available on the application process, but it hasn't been picked up. Um, the next most common is around the, the statutory guidance not being followed. So all councils should follow the statutory guidance. And Rosemary's point that we see small, small numbers is very valid. And, and we do see very good examples day to day as well. However, um, it is fairly common for us to assess that the guidance hasn't been followed in our casework. 
Rules of thumb is common around perhaps somebody has been awarded um, carpets on one occasion before, they've had to move for very good reasons, but the council has said that we, you know, we won't award a second time. Um, so it's cases like this that, that, that we would, um, you know, that, that might be a reason for us overturning the decision because, because we assess that it's not been fair and reasonable. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McPherson, you wanted to come in? Yeah, th th thank you, Convener. Just a number of points, but first of all, I wanted to uh, pick up on the delivery and accessibility question that you were looking at there. I just wondered if consideration has been given based on the analysis that you've done around whether delivery through the, the Social Security Agency in due course would provide benefits in terms of uh, consistency, economies of scale, and uh, all the accessibility that you said is, is, is not necessarily there across the board? I mean, effectively, it's, it's the centralised versus the dispersed model that we have. And um, I think it's fair to say we don't have a specific view or policy view on that. But I would make a number of observations. I think the points about consistency um, are very good, but equally... I would say the work that we are doing over and above simply deciding reviews is, is taking us towards consistency anyway. And the benefit of that is we're able to pick up good and poor practice. Where um, the more local service um, has a, a different sort of benefit, if you like, is it's in the, the integration and the... Um, local knowledge and the fact that you can do, like Dundee City Council have done, about maximising income by using other benefit services. So whilst you might achieve economies of scale in terms of administration, um, I'm the, the local version, I think, is, is probably much more people-focused about what's needed on the ground in that particular area. And whilst I can't say for certain... Um, there is a risk that centralising you might lose that. So I hope that's helpful. I don't know if anybody wants to do anything. Uh, that's it. very useful because we've been looking at that point in last week's session as well. I just also wanted to, Alison, you said that, the, the, Alison Jack, you said at the beginning that uh, you've noticed that issues with universal credit have, have uh, increased demand. I just wondered if, if you could expand on any more detail um, what sort of issues have emerged. And also, has the benefit cap had a, an effect uh, since it, its introduction last year on, on, on some of the case work and the different demands that you've seen? I think perhaps one or two examples of the benefit cap. So that hasn't been um, particularly common for us. Again, it is very small numbers in comparison to, to the whole fund. Um, universal credit... In particular, um, we, we do see issues to do with the wait periods at the start, although sometimes that's mitigated by, by benefit advances. Um, it is fairly common, however, for us uh, to see applicants facing difficulties due to the deductions that are coming off of the universal credit, which can be quite substantial. So that might lead to them facing crisis situations, perhaps repeat crisis situations, because they're expected to, to, to make these payments back over a relatively short period of time. Um, I know some of the recent changes in terms of, uh, you know, may, may help mitigate some of that. Um, we have had quite a number of cases where sanctions have been an issue as well for applicants. Um, so yes, as a fairly um, prevalent issue for us in our casework is, is, is links to universal credit and sanctioning and sanctions yeah. as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and just on the, the benefit cap, you said you'd only had a, a limited number of, of cases that you'd seen. Was there any connection in your experience between where housing demand is high uh, and housing costs are higher than that, or is that, is that knowledge not, not, not I'm available? I'm not sure I'd be able to answer that, I'm no, afraid. No problem. Yeah. Um, can I just ask one more question, Camina? Uh, th thank you. Uh, I just noticed you in, this, in the paper that you helpfully provided for the committee, uh, 18.1, you say that your future work will help councils deliver develop rather quality assurance mechanisms for checking their own casework. I just wondered if you could uh, perhaps expand on, on, on what you mean by that. Yeah, I can perhaps say that. It's something I, I alluded to earlier on, and it, it's, we're, we're looking to replicate something we've done for complaints handlers. And Rosemary mentioned the, the, the conference that was held in uh, February. 
And one of the issues there were, was around uh, communication, access and decision making. So the, the, the plan there is to develop a quality assurance tool that, that looks at the journey of a, an applicant from the, the way in which they access the service through to the way in which the, the application is received, acknowledged, things like reasonable adjustment, which Michelle uh, asked about, then through to properly understanding what this application uh, is for, whether it's community care grant or crisis grant, what is the need, and then properly assessing and making a decision on it. Uh, and the quality assurance tool will provide a number of uh, criteria that, that a, a decision maker should look, look at or look for in order to ensure the appropriate and the, the consistent decision. So that, that's, that's the, the thing that we're planning this year in terms of the, the work we're going to do to support bodies in terms of the decision making. And is that in order to help get a consistency in, in, in terms of... Uh, yeah, it's, it's about consistency throughout the whole process. Uh, it's about making the, the correct decision, identifying the, the correct needs and giving assurance that, that, uh, that the, the full application has been uh, considered and, uh, and awarded as appropriate. To that as well, because quality is not just about making the right decision, it's also about how the individual who's making an application is treated, it's about um, the interaction with the service. So, we try to, in developing that, capture all of that. Um, the, the other side of it is also um, if we have a limited resource. Local authorities have a limited resource, and the more we can do in terms of tools that others can use, and then if they identify something that they might need more help and support with, um, they may well approach us and say, could you do something extra for us on that? So it's as much about um, trying to provide an efficient way of improving quality, as well as rooting the responsibility for it with the local authorities, because they know their organisations better than we can ever know them. So we're trying to do all of that um, through this um, quality assurance and tool, tool kit cut type approach. One for you. <coughs> on the, the quality and assurance approach is uh, we, we've mentioned a number of times that the cases we see are a small proportion of the, the total population. Uh, the learning and improvement lies within the sector, so part of the quality assurance tool will be what have you learned and how can we improve services, not only within our council, but how can we share that across the, the, the wider sector. So learning and improvement will be a big part of uh, quality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can, we... can I just ask a, a supplementary on from the evidence that we received last week um, some of the third sector organisations found it quite difficult to um, access or, or, or understand the decisions by yourself in, in terms of, of ruling out that good practice and informing the local authorities could you maybe just want to comment on, on that yeah so I think one of the intentions over the coming year is that we look at some way of um, uh, producing some sort of quarterly digest of case decisions, case summaries. So um, what we said very early on um, in discussions with Scottish Government is that um, we're conscious of the, the funding levels for our, our service. Um, so we, with complaints, we, um, we provide a published summary of every decision that we reach. We don't have the funding, we didn't request the funding to do that with the Welfare Fund, but we do appreciate that it's really helpful for us to um, provide examples of our decision making. Um, as Alison said, we do that at the moment through um, sounding boards um, with stakeholders and through uh, Scottish Government uh, working group as well. But I think it would be helpful, uh, the more that we can publish, the better within the confines of the resources that we've been given to do that. I'd also add that we've, um, we're, we're also looking between us at how we can leverage more from our, our main communications function to try and use some of the learning from other areas to perhaps um, do the annual report for Welfare Fund in a, a slightly different way so there's more focus on cases and less on our performance. We can report that in our annual report and accounts. Um, I would say that we're part way through a journey, so what's very helpful for us is when we get the feedback about what people would like to hear about, because that will enable us then to, as Nikki says, look at how we use the resources we have um, to get a more meaningful set of information out there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in Mr. Are oh, you okay? Sorry, Mr. Balfour. Uh, and I'll bring in Mr. Griffin. Uh, 
Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, we heard evidence last week at committee of um, members of the public who were discouraged from taking forward applications to the Welfare Fund um, who, who would qualify for an award. And I realise that people who are discouraged and don't take forward an application, that the chances of it ever um, reaching your door is uh, probably unlikely. But just if you have any evidence or anyone who you've come across who's been in that situation where they've been discouraged from applying it in an effort to manage budgets. I couldn't, I couldn't say um, whether that was linked to, to budgets. I wouldn't be able to comment on that. But we have recorded a couple of um, examples of what I would call gatekeeping. So um, basically, an application should be taken um, for every applicant, even if um, perhaps it's, it's assessed that it might be declined at the first stage in the process, perhaps due to their application history. Um, but we have heard examples of, of applicants tell us that they haven't been allowed to, to make that application to the council. In these cases, we would then contact the council on the applicant's <coughs> behalf and, and query what had happened there because for, for, for gaining an accurate picture of demand, these applications should be taken. Also, if they don't enter the process, they can never, as, as you point out, make a review of that decision. So it's really important that, that that's not going on. It has been a, a few examples, but Nevertheless, it is a concern when, when applicants aren't able to make applications. And I think that comes back to the previous point about the value of sharing our case summaries, because I think um, it's, it would be very easy for us to clarify that point through published case summaries around um, the need to uh, take every application on its own merits and not on the basis of the judgment of what somebody's applied for previously. Um, it's quite clear, that's quite clear in the guidance and it's quite easy to clarify. I, I think the uh, there is a, a higher level strategic point about this as well and that is if not everybody who wants to apply is applying whether they are turned down or not what we can't know is what the unmet demand is um, but it doesn't mean there's a cost saving overall what it means is there has not been money paid from the welfare fund and I think it's important we remember that these are individuals who are the most vulnerable in our society. So if they are not getting money from the welfare fund, then where is the other social cost coming from? Because there will be something else very likely. So whilst it, it's probably almost impossible to quantify, if somebody's not getting crisis grants, if they're not getting their community care grants, but they're having to feed themselves or you know, provide basic things, then where is that coming from um, and what is the cost to us as a society in terms of uh, links to perhaps survival crime, things like that. And I'm not sure we can ever know, but I think I just want to make the point that it's not just about access for the individual, it's, it's also about us collectively. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Um, Ms. Jack, is, are there any particular local authorities um, that are, what I would say, worst offenders for this than any other? I, I couldn't really single anyone out. I think it's it's probably, um, it's been from a mix, really. So, yeah, I, I couldn't really say that there's there's worst offenders or, or otherwise, really. The other question I had was, do you have any evidence of applications where a grant award would have been made, but the budget set aside by the local authority has been exhausted by that point in the financial year? No, but we, we, ha we are aware of a, a few local authorities that have gone on to the, the high, most compelling priority level. So that's where um, there needs to be a higher threshold uh, to be awarded a grant or to be awarded certain items. The threshold is higher, and that's within the guidance that they can go on to that level as their budget declines throughout the year. It shouldn't necessarily be towards the start of the year. They should be managing it so that that would only be um, in the latter part of the year. But yes, we, we are aware of a, a, a couple of authorities that, that have moved to that rating. Yep. And I, I have been contacted by some constituents who have made applications in February, March, and have been told that they wouldn't be successful, but if they held off until April, then they would likely um, get an award. What is your view on the, 
the fairness of that system. It's, fairness is a good question. It's fair in the sense that the public bodies concerned are applying the guidance and the system that is there. Um, if they are open about it and transparent about why, the question of fairness is really then about whether it's fair that there is a discretionary level or whether there should be set criteria that says if you apply for a grant and you qualify, you get it, um, irrespective of the priority you're at. And I, I think it's probably not one that is within our remit um, to give any form of policy view on, but I do understand the point because just looking at it um, objectively, it means in reality that you could get something in one council area at, in February that you couldn't get in another. Um, and I think that's a question for the policy makers, really. Okay, thank you. Um, just, uh, I'll bring Ms. Ballantyne in fresh time. Just, just want to pick up briefly, and I don't know whether this is something you can you can really answer or have an opinion on, but obviously there was a change to the way the budgets were, were delivered out. Uh, um, initially sort of uh, agreed with COS and then changed to SIMD, but with a waiting and now purely to SIMD. And I wondered if you had any view as to whether that is working, um, because I know in some areas, obviously, they do, we don't hit the multiple deprivation index, but there is deprivation, but it's scattered, so you don't get that same, same impact. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm aware, I, I don't think that the, the change um, has been noticeable to us in terms of the cases that we see. Um, again, I, I think it's a policy decision about how the fund is um, distributed. Um, I think from our, our perspective, as long as that system is open and transparent to everybody, that's, that's as it should be. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I don't think we've seen examples of changes in funding arrangements. Okay, um, Ms. McGuire. Morning, panel. Um, you mentioned there about the you know additional pressure on um, the, the welfare fund as a, as a pot that a local authority might have. And I certainly know from my time as a councillor that demand the the ratings kind of changed. Can you identify um, areas or, or where they've had to, to put the threshold up, what, what was the thing that put the extra pressure on the welfare fund? You mentioned universal credit before and sanctions. I think it's useful for the committee to understand, you know, if, you're, if we're going local authority by local authority, sometimes it is that, that rollout of... Yeah, and, and the particular council that I'm thinking of, I, I don't necessarily think that they are full service yet, I think, or, or they weren't um, until very recently. So I think it, it was more linked to... Um, high levels of deprivation and, and just demand in that area. Um, you, you know, I, I, who's to say that it might, you know, future councils that come on board, um, that might not have an impact. Um, but I'd, I'd, I haven't been able to see a direct impact between between that and the move to high most compelling that, that I can recall. If I may just <laughs> come back in, it'd be interesting to have for the record as well the proportion of cases that you're dealing with, sort of versus the proportion of um, our constituents that are receiving it. You know, because obviously you're you're reviewing it's a probably a fairly small number in terms of you know how much money is actually going out and and how much local authorities are giving. What what's the sort of proportion? Did we pull that proportion? Um, we've got the figures, but. I confess, not immediately to hand. May I send them to you afterwards? Oh, thank you. I'm looking to my colleagues for further questions. Um, if I could, could finally... Um, I'll bring Mr Johnson first, thanks. Uh, thank you, Convener. <coughs> that, that's very kind of you. Um, can I just ask a little about community care grants and crisis grants? Because the... Um, you know, there were increases on the previous year in both cases. And I think it's fair to say that the panel we heard from last week were very much of a view that if if grants were given when they were required, um, it, could, it, would, it could be very much a preventative measure, that we might end up spending a, f a fortune um, had we just given someone, you know, several hundred pounds, but a failed tenancy could cost us a great deal more. Do you think enough attention is being paid to that 
I, I know you're looking very much at specific cases when they come in, but you know, Homeless Action Scotland and Shelter both raised the impact um, that you know, lacking access to a, a crisis grant or a community care grant when you needed it might make. This is almost one of the how long is a piece of string questions because just considering the grants in isolation I don't think would really necessarily give the answers to how much is there, is it well used, is it all appropriate. I think if you, as you've suggested, consider it in the context of somebody's entire situation there's probably more work to be done in terms of research to find out what the full cost might be of an individual's life journey as opposed to their welfare fund journey. So, yet yeah, there's, there's a real cost saving in terms of tenancies if you look at it in that way. Um, but there are perhaps other things down the line, and I'm not sure that we have the data for that. But equally, I'm not convinced that the data that's out there has been perhaps collated and looked at in a holistic way to see where the true cost of things lie, because um, it could be as simple as preventing somebody going for a payday, a short-term loan, um, or, or you know, a doorstep loan, by having some money to get something essential like food. So I'd welcome something, and we gradually. Uh, gladly contribute what we know, but I think there's more work to be done to understand it, actually. Okay. I mean, it certainly seems to me that there is more work to be done, too, in ensuring people are aware of links to other services. Um, you know, that, that those links are, are widely advertised and available when they're needed. And I'm just not... Uh, you know, it seems, too, that there really is a need here to ensure that best practice is shared across the whole country. Absolutely agree, and um, I think I come back to um, the point Nikki made about the telephone calls and the conversations. Um, it's not always enough to advertise what's available. You often, at an individual level, have to help somebody understand what is available, um, because if they are not easily contactable by um, email or they are in a position where um, they've reached this point, they're not likely to be able to access the channels that would give all this information. So actually the personal contact, um, and this probably comes back to the local model, I think it puts a very different emphasis on integrating how welfare fund is delivered in the knowledge of other things to help people holistically, as opposed to here's a grant, that's just one element of it. I don't know if if you want to add anything yeah. to that. I, I mean, certainly, <coughs> I think crisis grants have slightly gone up and community care grants have, have slightly gone down in terms of overall applications. And um, community care grants, in, in my view, are the more preventative spend. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, in, in terms of them slightly going down, that, you know, there's maybe something to be said there. Um, we, we have, as part of our annual review of the guidance, we do think it's important that people are able to access these t um, with, within um, reasonable timescales as well. Um, and one of the issues that we highlighted was around people not having to wait until they had their keys to a new tenancy before they could apply, um, or, because the, you know there's waiting times for processing as well. And that's one of the changes that we've we've, we've put forward uh, to Scottish government, um, because even that you know a few weeks in a, in a home with with nothing with no essential items could impact on the likelihood of, of that individual being able to sustain that tenancy. Um, so yeah, we, you know, there are things that can be done, definitely improvement, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Ballantyne? Just one <coughs> final question. You, you started this piece of evidence session talking about trends and the fact that you, you, know, you monitor trends, but equally as the session's gone on, you've identified that there hasn't been long enough in many cases. And I just wondered, obviously, with, with going from live service to, to full service on UC, and also with the changes that came through in the budget from last autumn, how long do you anticipate needing before we can get an accurate picture of trend and impact, and particularly that impact coming through on the, social, the Scottish Welfare Fund? Um, so I, I think, uh, I know um, we've highlighted this issue, I think that you have to bear in mind that we're, we're seeing 
applications in the hundreds. So I think that, as with complaints, what we encourage local authorities to do is really analyse their own data and, so, and, so, and also for this committee so that you can get an annual picture because with the best will in the world, I don't think that the numbers of cases that we see is going to give you a national picture. So you, you have to go to the local authority data to identify those trends. Thank you. Is not to, uh, to separate out impact and trend because things like universal credit, when they fully ro when that fully rolls out to all areas, there is likely to be some impact. Um, the trend may be something it takes us much longer uh, to identify. But I'd, I'd fully endorse what Nikki said and um, also whether collectively we can um, improve statistical reporting, you know, numbers reporting. Uh, not just from us, but also from councils themselves, because it's it's the collective information that will give us uh, the, the better value. And, and if you compare that to the model that you have for complaints handling across local authorities, all, all local authorities have to publish their complaint statistics on an annual basis, including the learning and improvement um, that they've garnered from those complaints. <coughs> and this is John's area's work. So... Um, there's certainly scope there for something similar along um, the welfare fund. One thing I would add is it would be important to ensure that every every council is reporting their performance against the same set of key performance indicators. The, the data has got to be gathered and, and reported consistent, consistently so as to allow for that comparison, compare and contrast and benchmark performance. And that's where the, the true value lies in identifying themes and trends and patterns. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I just finally ask, um, one of the, the new parts in the Scottish Welfare Fund is the introduction of the Family Reunion and Crisis Grants. I think, Ms Jack, you mentioned the high proportion of cases that you deal with from Glasgow already, and obviously Glasgow and North Atlantic areas where they have refugee communities, this, this will um, be additional pressure. I just wondered if, if there were any, any indications of how, how that's being embedded into the, the system at the moment. I think it's probably too early early to say. Um, we, we, we have dealt with a number of applications involving um, refugees. In fact, we asked Scottish Government to add um, that to the list of vulnerabilities. Um, there's a list of vulnerabilities and we thought it was important that, 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 that refugees uh, was noted on that, being a refugee was noted as, as being on that list. Um, as I say, I think it is too early to say because it is a, a very recent change um, and, and it, you know, it remains to be seen if, if any cases come through to, our, to ourselves. Um, so I'm not really able to add, add to that, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions from the committee? Um, can I thank you all for your um, attendance this morning? It's been very helpful as we're um, completing this bit of work on the Welfare Fund. So um, thank you very much for your attendance. Let's suspend for a couple of minutes to allow uh, panel to...